So if you remember from our past unit, we talked about the scientific revolution and how the heliocentric theory really changed the dynamic of thinking throughout Europe and as a matter of fact for the entire world in this sense. Because scientists at this point were not just questioning science, but they were also questioning other things. Religion, politics, government, even their social lives. Everything changed. So that's what we're going to get into with this next unit, which is called Enlightenment. And this is your data decode 8.2. So what are we learning here? Well, by the end of this lesson, you should be able to identify the major causes of the Enlightenment and be able to summarize the major ideas of Enlightenment philosophers. However, by the end of the unit, you should be able to evaluate or make a judgment on how the Enlightenment ideals impacted the development of the Western world, economically, politically, and religiously. Here are some key vocabulary that you'll hear me mention throughout this particular lesson. Social contract, salon, laissez-faire, free enterprise system or the free market, rationalism, bill of rights, and definitely philosophy. Please take time to make sure that you jot these vocabulary in your data decode notes. So let's get started. What was the Enlightenment in the first place? Well, it stemmed from the scientific revolution and it was an 18th century philosophical movement of intellectuals who were greatly impressed by the achievements of the scientific revolution. Enlightenment by its actual word means to be very knowledgeable, aware, and free from ignorance. So at this time, Europeans started really delving into questioning everything. Sciences, thought, existence, everything was questioned. So the ideas of the Enlightenment would encourage the improvement of society through the, the use of reason. And instead of looking at religion for explaining everything, they started to take a more secular or non-religious outlook at looking at practically everything. They also they started to develop these philosophic or thought-based ideas. And intellectuals of the Enlightenment were known as philosophe or philosopher in French. They were writers, professors, journalists, economists, and above all, as you see here, social reformers, meaning that they gave their ideas and they were determined to change the way the society looked. They mainly came from nobility and the middle class, and their spirit of criticism came to everything, including religion and especially politics and government. As a matter of fact, a new religious philosophy known as deism began to spread in the 18th century, which is the 1700s, and it was based on reason and natural law. Many of our founding fathers of the United States were deists. So individual rights. The Enlightenment brought about new theories about how government should be operated or ran. And many of those ideas were based on the rights of individuals, particularly natural rights. As a matter of fact, one of the philosophers that you've learned before when we talked about the scientific revolution, Rene Descartes, remember, I think, therefore I am, he mentioned that anyone with a good education is able to reason. And if they're able to reason, they can make good decisions and that those decisions will then be able to, and those people will then be able to exercise free will, meaning that they can make their own choices for how they want to live their lives. So let's take a minute to pause and think, how is this movement of enlightenment different than the ideology of absolutism? Is it A, enlightenment emphasized natural rights for individuals, while absolutism centered on divine right of monarchs and royalty, B, enlightenment emphasized natural rights for monarchies, whereas absolutism focused on enlightenment only for royalty, C, 
Enlightenment focused on scientific discoveries, while absolutism focused on Christian doctrine. Or D, Enlightenment emphasized militant Catholicism, while absolutism focused on Baroque artwork. What do you think? If you said the answer was A, then you're absolutely right. Remember that Enlightenment focused and they were heavily concerned about the individual's natural rights. While absolutism, of course, by its nature absolute, means that monarchies were centered on divine right and establishing their authority and having all the power centered around them. So now that we know about what enlightenment is and the difference between enlightenment, the enlightenment movement, and absolutism, let's talk a little bit about these philosophers that exercised the enlightenment principles. So let's take a look at John Locke. John Locke was a philosopher in the 17, early 17th century, and he wrote a body of work called The Two Treatises of Government. And in this body of work, he argued against the idea of absolutism or absolute rule by a single individual, a monarchy, right? Locke thought that everyone has basic natural rights like life, liberty, and property, meaning that as a person, you are naturally inherent to have life, you should have freedom, and you should be able to own property or have something that you call your own. But John Locke knew that it would be tough to protect these rights, so he figured and argued that the government's power should come from an agreement of the people or the community and not by the monarchy or the government itself. All right, so let's take a look at this French philosopher. Yes, this is his full name. <laughs> Charles Louis de Seconda de Baron de Montesquieu. But we're just going to call him Montesquieu for short. So Montesquieu's writing or renowned work, The Spirit of Laws, centered around the studying of the government and how it functions. So Montesquieu argued that the separation of powers is necessarily for a government to run effectively. He also described what was called branches of government. The executive, legislative, and judicial branches would all have their distinct roles and maintain checks and balances to make sure that one branch does not have more power than the other. Now, where does this sound familiar? Well, if you said our own U.S. government, then you're absolutely correct. Our own U.S. government has instituted this ph political ph uh, philosophy of separation of powers, and we definitely have those distinct branches, and we have a checks and balance system, all due to Montesquieu. So let's talk about another French philosopher. His name was Francois Arouet, or Voltaire. He was a prominent figure of the Enlightenment, uh, practically one well-known philosopher of the Enlightenment, and he's known for his criticism of Christianity, and he is very much known for his advocation for freedom, especially natural rights, such as freedom of speech and freedom of the press. He also advocated this new philosophy of deism that we talked about before, which was based on reason and natural law. He figured that God was the creator of the universe, but he created the universe like a clock and set it in motion without interfering or governing it so much. Um, and he just made it that way by natural law. Okay. And that was his theory. So let's talk about another French philosopher. His name was Denis Diderot. And his most prominent achievement was the establishment of what we call the encyclopedia. But it was known as the Classified Dictionary of the Sciences, Arts, and Trades, but it is called the Encyclopedia. The encyclopedia aimed to change the way people viewed the world and became a potent weapon in the fight against the outdated French society. So in France, there were a lot of criticisms against absolute monarchies and he was one of them that used his encyclopedia to speak out against this outdated French society religiously and politically. The encyclopedia focuses on religious toleration 
meaning all religions, and it was instrumental against challenging those religious superstitions that was promoted by different Protestant and Catholic churches. So let's pause and think for a minute. This is a quote by Voltaire. Let's read it. Freedom of speech is a shield and a weapon. It protects us and allows us to express our thoughts. How does this quote by Voltaire express enlightenment thinking? Is it A, Voltaire's quote reflects the enlightenment emphasis on the power of the monarchy? B, the quote highlights Voltaire's support for strict censorship of speech? C, it suggests that freedom of speech is a fundamental right and aligns with enlightenment ideals? Or D, Voltaire's statement promotes the idea that only the monarchy should have the right to express their thoughts. What do you think? Well, if you said the answer was C, then you're absolutely correct. In this particular quote, Voltaire is expressing his thoughts and his opinions, his philosophy on freedoms, especially natural rights. And in this case, he's talking about freedom of speech as a fundamental natural right, which does align with enlightenment principles of natural rights. Good job. Let's continue with our Enlightenment philosophers. Here we have another French philosopher, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and he was influential in the 18th century as well. He believed in people's innate goodness, but that the society corrupted them. He developed what was called a social contract theory, and he suggested that people have to give up some of their personal freedom for the greater good or the general will of the society or the community. But he cautioned against the government becoming too powerful. So what Rousseau suggested was a direct democracy where citizens can participate in their own decision making, therefore giving up their personal freedom for the greater good of the community. And that's the social contract theory. Sounds familiar? Probably is, because it's embedded in our own US government. Here we have a woman enlightenment philosopher, and she is Mary Wollstonecraft. And she's widely regarded as the founder of modern European and American movements for women's rights. And in her famous work, A Vindication of the Rights of Women, she observed that those who argued that women must obey men also believed that the government based on power of monarchs over their subjects was completely wrong. So according to Wollstonecraft, the power of men over women was equally as unjust. So she argued that the Enlightenment was founded on the ideal of reasoning, reasoning for all human beings, not just men. So she proposed that since women possess the ability to reason too, that they're entitled to the same rights of men in education, economics, and in political life. Here we have an English Enlightenment philosopher, Thomas Hobbes, and he is known as one of the most prominent figures in political philosophy. And his social contract theory or ideology advocated for a powerful central government based on rationality or rationalism. Hobbes believed that humans were innately selfish and competitive and in order to make sure that they don't run amok and have complete anarchy in a society, anarchy being just total chaos and no rules and regulations, he proposed having a very strong central government there to make sure to maintain order and avoid chaos. Well, his ideas are controversy and debated, but for the most part, if you think about it, that is kind of our philosophy today in our US government. We have a strong central government, the executive branch, that is there to maintain order and prevent chaos, such as the judicial system, right? That's there to maintain order and prevent chaos. Now, it wasn't just in politics that we had uh, an enlightenment movement. We also had an economic enlightenment movement. So there was a French group known as the physiocrats 
and their aim to identify natural economic laws that can help govern human society. So according to their philosophy, allowing individuals to freely pursue their economic self-interest would benefit the society as a whole. So the physiocrats firmly believed in what was called laissez-faire. Laissez-faire literally by in French means hands off. So they're advocating that the state or the government or the monarchy in this case should leave the economy alone. They should not have their hands or their opinions into how the, uh, the economy should be ran. The physiocrats believe that the state or the country should not interfere with economic affairs and that markets should be allowed to operate freely without government invention. So basically what that means is that physiocrats at that time believed that the government should not be interfering with how everyday people made their money or how they handled their markets. They should allow people to negotiate or handle their own markets and their own self-interest and in turn that would benefit this entire society. So today, of course, in our current world, the principles of laissez-faire and our free enterprise system are still debated and are often used as a basis for economic policies around the world. However, if you have to take a look at it, our own system in the United States is based on these principles of laissez-faire and a free enterprise system, which lends itself to what is called a capitalist system, where the government minorly interferes with the means and production and distribution of the market and how products are, are sold and developed. And that is done by the society and themselves. This is why we have self-made or self-based businesses that are owned and operated by the people themselves and not the government. So one person that was prominent in economic enlightenment was Adam Smith. And he's widely regarded as the founder of modern so social science economics. His book, The Wealth of Nations, is considered a landmark in economic theory. Because Smith believed that the government should not interfere in economic matters, and he emphasized the significance of supply and demand in a society. So what's supply and demand? Well, supply, if you have a lot of product, right, the demand may be lower. However, if you have a little of that product, then the demand may be higher, meaning more people may want it. So he figured that by managing that supply and demand and the importance of supply and demand would help a person that was marketing their products or services. It would help to develop their business and thereby developing their business, they would thrive as a society, but that the government should not interfere as much in that development. According to Smith, the government only had three responsibilities to safeguard a society against any invasion, protect its citizens against injustice, and provide public works that private individuals just could not afford, such as the construction of roads, canals, bridges, etc. So here we are, let's apply it. You're gonna use this following quote to answer the question. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This comes from the Declaration of Independence that Thomas Jefferson wrote July 4th, 1776. Here's your question. What enlightenment ideals are included in this excerpt above from the Declaration of Independence? Go ahead and write that in your data decode notes 8.2 and let's discuss it in class, or you can let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below. Thank you for tuning in, and I will see you in the next episode. Peace.